The question is that this will be now read a second time and the member for Fremantle, the Assistant Minister, has the call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And uh, can I too speak in support of this bill? I thank the member for Wannan for his uh, comments and, of course, the, uh, both the Chair and the Deputy Chair of the Parliamentary Joint Standing Committee for Intelligence and Security for their contribution uh, to the report that's just tabled, which is relevant to the bill we're considering. Uh, as the member for Wannan noted, uh, this essentially gives our uh, security, intelligence and law enforcement agencies um, and Australia as a whole the ability to protect Australians, and it does <coughs> that uh, in a few ways. Uh, it's been in place for some time. This bill allows it to continue uh, operating in circumstances where we need that um, to be the case. It's good that we can consider these things uh, seriously and carefully. It's good that we have a committee process that looks at uh, these kinds of legislation um, open-mindedly and with a preparedness to uh, examine uh, how they were established and how they work and whether or not uh, changes need to be considered. And it's good that we can have a, uh, a sober and serious conversation uh, here um, about uh, bills like this and, and what they enable, which is essentially uh, to see the uh, declared areas provisions continue for another three years. Um, Deputy Speaker, in terms of how they help to make Australians safe, they, they do operate in a couple of different directions. Uh, <coughs> one of the things about um, having uh, uh, a declared uh, area uh, put in place is that it does, uh, it does stand as a clear signal to the Australian community that that is not a place that, um, that Australians should consider going. Uh, and, and essentially um, it, it happens where uh, in some part of the world you have a listed ter terrorist organisation engaging in a hostile activity or as uh, Director General Vasio, uh, Mr Burgess has said, an ungoverned or uncontrolled space where a terrorist organisation is operating. For understandable reasons, those are very dangerous places and we don't want Australians going there. Um, declared areas have only been put in place twice, as the member for one and noted, once in 2014 in relation to Syria and then again in 2018 in relation to Iraq. Uh, so when we consider things that uh, the member for one and properly described as being extraordinary, we should take uh, some comfort and some confidence from the fact that these measures are only being used when uh, it is necessary that they be put in place to keep Australians safe. Um, there have been a handful of charges made under these provisions and I, I believe only, only one conviction. But where uh, these provisions need to be used, uh, it, will, it will certainly be to ensure that um, Australians are safe from the potential, and this is the second direction in which these provisions work, from the potential that someone who has gone and been uh, in an area uh, that is uh, dominated to some extent by a terrorist organisation engaging in, in hostile activity, that that person has been involved in the activity or otherwise uh, affected or influenced by that activity uh, with the possible outcome that they return to Australia and present a risk to our safety and security. Um, I know through the committee process that I, I was also a part of, through the Parliamentary Joint Standing Committee on Intelligence and Security, that uh, we had uh, expert civil society organisations come and present to us about uh, the nature of this legislation and the, the framework that it puts in place. That's legitimate, uh, as, as the member for Wannan noted. Uh, it's, it's how our system of parliamentary democracy, including our parliamentary committee system, works at its best, making sure that we do apply uh, scrutiny to measures that inevitably infringe on the rights of individuals. Um, these measures do limit the ability of an Australian to move freely about the world. Uh, we don't want that to be the case in circumstances that are anything other than extraordinary. And, and that's why um, these measures have been used uh, very sparingly and only in those most um, extreme circumstances. But the um, civil society organisations that I talk about, uh, like uh, the Human Rights uh, Commission and the Law Council of Australia, uh, legitimately ask questions about uh, 
uh, how the framework operates, and they've made observations to us about some parallel uh, uh, frameworks um, in the case of, the, of, of how the equivalent regime works in the United Kingdom. It was closely based on what Australia put in place, um, and we should, we should take some, some pride in that, in the sense we've made a contribution to the way that other countries also um, protect their citizens. Um, but th there ha have been concerns raised about the way in which uh, the, the framework operates to acknowledge that there might be some legitimate reasons for an Australian citizen to be in a declared area. Uh, the, re the regime already has a set of identified exceptions, uh, but it has been brought, was brought to the, to the attention of the Intelligence and Security Committee that further consideration could be given to whether or not uh, those exceptions are as broad and flexible as, as they might need to be. Uh, and I understand why uh, the Intelligence and Security Committee has made a recommendation that the government give further consideration to that. Uh, the, uh, the committee has also made a recommendation about the application of a grace period. Uh, as the member for Wannan noted, the, the, the way that this particular framework operates is that there, when a declaration is made, uh, it, it literally becomes criminal for uh, an Australian to remain or go to or to remain um, in, in that area from, from that time. Uh, unless they have one of the, uh, the limited defined um, reasons or exceptions for being there. Uh, the United Kingdom framework does have a, a grace period that is just mindful of the fact that when, when you go from not being a declared area to a declared area overnight, uh, that there might be people who happen to be there already uh, or someone who's, who's en route to that place uh, in a way that it's not reasonable for them to understand that it's become declared in a short period of time. And so uh, the operation of a, of a grace period uh, is, not, uh, is not unworthy of consideration. The recommendation of the committee is that the government gives some consideration to that. It has been the way that the UK framework um, has operated. Uh, but, Deputy Speaker, in essence, this is uh, a measure that's been in place now for some period of time. It was put in place by the previous government. Uh, uh, I know that the member for McPherson, who was in the chair before you, Deputy Speaker, had some involvement in that. We acknowledge that work. It is something that Australians expect uh, the parliament as a whole, the government and non-government members, work on in, in a collegiate way. That doesn't mean it's uncontested. That doesn't mean it's unexamined uh, or that it goes without uh, a healthy amount of uh, of um, scrutiny and sometimes even disagreement. But it does mean that as much as possible, particularly in areas like this, because they are so grave and because they can be so fraught, that we bring to that conversation the appropriate uh, level of, of sobriety and reasonableness. Uh, and, uh, and to conclude, you know, and to pick up uh, what the member for Wannan said about the, uh, the change in the threat level that was announced by the D Director General of ASIO recently, uh, the way that we conduct ourselves on these matters, and the way that leaders in, across the community, particularly legislators and parliamentarians, conduct themselves on these issues matter, ma matters. The way we talk about them matters. Uh, and when, when there are circumstances that are uh, fraught and, and febrile, and there is concern and, and distress in the community, it's our obligation, all of us, um, to talk about these things in a way that is measured and considerate and compassionate. Uh, and I think you know, the contribution that the, uh, the Deputy Chair made, made before uh, was in that vein. You know, he, he's right to examine um, these matters and to have views, and they won't always be uh, completely in sync with the government of the day. That kind of contestability is essential to making sure that our decisions have the highest integrity. But he nevertheless made that contribution um, with his characteristic um, reasonableness and evenness of tone. And I think we all know, after some of the circumstances that have been characteristic of 2024, that we need more of that. We need more of that. We need to make sure that if we want peacefulness and harmony and social inclusion, that all of our conduct must contribute to that, and certainly our conduct in this place, the tone and the substance uh, 
and the manner and the respect that we have for one another uh, is, a, is a form of leadership that the community wants to see and, and can therefore and can thereby um, replicate in the way that they approach these things and that's in all of our interests.